response, were you even close to anything that could be considered a rational thought? Welcome to the show today. I'm your host, Doug Crow, with the Author Brand Show. You're going to want to take notes. Our guest today, oh my gosh, his resume is as long as a show, so I'll just have to be a little abbreviate here. Um, he's been featured in business magazines, highlighted in Wall Street Journal, best-selling author. He's even appeared on Focus on the Family, Oprah, and Dateline NBC. He's no slouch to the media. He spoke around the globe to 35 countries, over a million people. That's one million people. And as America's foremost thought leader, he's impacted thousands with his powerful message of leadership, success, and business development. He's also served as keynote speaker to organizations such as Harley Davidson on their 100th anniversary, uh, Duke Energy, John Hancock, Boys and Cl Girls Club of America, Salvation Army, Century 21, and I can go on forever. Um, he served on the PR committee, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, and was a member of the Government Relations Advisory Board for the Boys and Girls Clubs of America. So welcome to the show today, my friend and mentor, Bo Short. Bo, how are no. you? Friend is exactly right. And yeah, Doug, I right. couldn't be better. And I, before we even start, number one, sure. thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here. Yeah. But, but number two, I just want to tell you something. I love what you do. I love, I love the, the mission that you have for helping people because uh, I'm a writer mm -hmm. and, and uh, I write speeches because obviously I speak, I write books, I write music. So mm -hmm. I, I understand the craft of writing and then delivering the message. Mm -hmm. What I've learned about people, and this is what I love about what you do, is people, everyone, has a story to tell. Some stories are more compelling than others, mm -hmm. but everyone has a story to tell, but not everyone knows how to tell their story. Yep. Yep. And what I so love about your mission and your work is you're able to take that story that people have to tell and put it as words on a on a piece of paper and put it in a book so now that they can share their story with other people whether they ever speak about it or not they can share that story in a compelling fashion so i, I admire you and i and congratulations on on, on your success and how you help so many people well, thank you very much um to to i appreciate it so much and it is funny because i i i love hearing people's stories and it's so much it's gratifying for me personally and professionally some of them have some amazing stories and they, you're right. They don't know how to tell it effectively. I mean, half our ghostwriters write fiction. They know about story arcs and character development and hero and nemesis and these things. So um, a guy in a boardroom is like, well, how can we make this compelling? We got to be able to weave some real intrigue and intention in that. So it's, it's important. Um, yeah, I, I think, I think too, sometimes when you live this stuff yeah, and they, they, it's just a part of your life, it's like you're so glad cancer. Yeah. Um, and it dramatically changed my life mm -hmm. in, in oddly such a positive way. And I know other people that have experienced cancer will tell you that it was the best thing that ever happened to me. And I understand that. I understand that because you, you, you see the brevity of life and you also mm -hmm. understand the importance of what you do today. Yeah. But people go through these things and challenges in their life and it's just a part of life. Right. And they don't understand, as you say, how to tell that in a compelling way mm -hmm. to people that that can impact people in a positive way. So yeah. anyway, I just I just want you to know that. Oh, thank you so you. much. Um, one of the things you mentioned before that we started the show today was some of the core principles or things that you're working on. And we mentioned the word, um, you know, mentorship for executives. Tell me more about that. Yeah, I we were just talking about what I do professionally mm -hmm. now, and it's yeah. and it's I'm able to take. 35 years of uh, hopefully at this stage wisdom, let's, let's hope, hope it's that, but, but I've been very blessed to have very, I've been very blessed with success. Now, what that means is I've had wins and losses. I've had a lot of failures along the way. I've had hard knocks, the whole thing, because I think it's silly to think you just wake up and you're successful. You have to go through this journey to get there. Um, so I spend a lot of time now talking to companies from a, a, a keynote platform or, or, training their, their salespeople or their customer service people or their executives. And I do a lot of executive mentoring. And what, I, what we were talking about was the difference between mentoring and coaching. And it's nothing to, to, to um, undermine the value of a coach. I'm not trying to do that. 
But I think there's a whole different level of information that you impart when you actually mentor somebody. Yeah. Because there's so much about getting beyond some superficial things Mm -hmm. and going deep into what really drives people to do the things they do. And you can't gain that with a year of experience or five years of experience or 10 years. I mean, those are, that's decades of work of interacting Mm -hmm. with people. And so I spent a lot of time with executives to, to kind of help them redirect, you know, where they're going and to try to figure out how to be better at their job Mm -hmm. and their, you know, and not just their job, but their home life as well. Right. Um, And to kind of live their best and highest effort. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so that they can look back on their life, having had the experience of having what I had, you can look back on your life and say, it mattered. It made a difference. Right. You know, I, I work with a bunch of Vistas chairs and, um, it's one of the largest, you know, CEO networking groups out there and they have groups, uh, you know, 16 people at a time get together for like a half day and work on their business stuff. And I talked to one of the chairs and I said, what do you guys talk about on your one-on-ones? And she said to me. 100% 100% of the time, it's personal stuff. Yep. It's how their personal life shows up in business. Yep. So when you're mentoring people, is that the same thing for you? Is it a lot of like, when you say going deep, is it what is going on inside their heart or what? Oh, yeah. I, I, yeah, I think she's right on target. I mean, you're going to find, listen, by the time somebody gets to a certain level in business, they've got a core competency. I mean, yeah. they've got a skill set. Uh-huh. And, and, and generally, they know how to deploy that skill set in their job. Mm -hmm. Uh, That doesn't mean they're always a great leader. I mean, there are people that rise to certain levels and aren't great. So we can hit on as much of that as you want to. But, but what you find when people struggle at work, it's all, it's, it's usually not work related. Mm -hmm. It's usually deeper than that. It's usually something they're going through in their personal life that Mm -hmm. impacts their work life. Um, Or, or, or it's the people, it's the people around them, even at work. Mm -hmm. You know, and, but it's but it's generally not when my boss is a knucklehead kind of attitude. It's right. it's it's they 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 they're trying to find their way with working with different personalities. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, because let's face it, when you're the boss or when you're in charge, people generally do what you say. But that doesn't mean you're always effective getting them to do it the the right way. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I think a lot of it is very personal. Right. And, and it and it impacts people's lives. Right. I know the um, the number one um, book in, in business and number one topic for keynotes is leadership. Um, and it's been that way for decades. W- why, we, why has nobody figured this out yet? Yeah, I, you know, it's interesting. I, I don't know. I mean, it's such it's the, the downside to leadership as a topic is it's generic. Yeah. And so it's easy to chase these rabbits, you know, right. down different paths. Um, but the but at the end of the day, it, I mean, it's, if you just look at the, the McDonald's brothers, mm-hmm. Dick and Maurice McDonald, here they have this incredible idea um, that that I would suggest that probably Henry Ford was the greatest influence in the fast food business right. than anybody mm-hmm. because of the assembly line, and that's kind of the idea that they had, and they they wanted to you know they had the fastest, most profitable restaurant in America at the time. And you look at this, these people that birthed this idea. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and so they said, well, let's franchise this idea. And they only sold, it, I think, 10 franchises. Two of them actually opened uh-huh. until Ray Kroc came along. And now there's over 30,000 McDonald's. But the difference in these two wasn't necessarily the size of their vision. Because to have a vision like the McDonald's brother had was huge. It was the, it was the level of leadership that they exhibited. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and you look at the McDonald's brothers, they just didn't have the lead, same leadership level that, that Ray Kroc had. Right. Um, but, but that's the challenge with leadership is, is you have good leaders, you have bad leaders, you have, I mean, let's face it, take, take a job, take a typical job. And everybody that's watching this and listening to this, think about this for a minute. On a scale of one to 10, 10 being the greatest leaders in the world. And I, you know, I'm no 10. You know, I think that you're always aspiring to be something like that. Mm-hmm. But one is that level where people don't even know what leadership means. Right. And it's not bad. These are still good people. These are friends and neighbors and everything. But because all this is, is, is if I could put it this way, it's a leadership acumen from okay. one to 10. If your boss is a five, and make up the number, whatever a five mm-hmm. would be, if your boss is a five, chances are 
you're surrounded by threes and fours. Right, right. Because a five always recruits threes and fours into the organization because it makes a five feel better. But if your boss is a seven, you see a lot of eights and nines because a seven brings in eights and nines because they know it makes them better. Mm -hmm. And and it's just where people find themselves. If I'm a five, I'm going to bring in threes and fours because I want to feel good. Yeah. If I'm a seven, I want to break eights and nines because I want to be good. Mm -hmm. um, but there's all these little nuances of leadership within a company, and most of them are, are not process-related. They're person-related, individual-related, how they get along with people. Right. Well, how they get along with people. And that's yeah. the thing that people have a hard time understanding. They say, well, I can do the work. Getting the job done is more than doing the work. Yep. Yeah, getting other people to do, yeah, yeah, to be inspired and do their own thing. When you're talking to these uh, executives and mentoring them, is there a common thread or common theme that you see more often than others in terms of their challenges or what they're working on? I think most of the challenges that people work on uh, or run into is people related. Yeah. You know, it's it's funny. One a, a great book, and I know you you know it. The five love languages. Yeah. Everybody yeah. talks about the five love languages and think that's about a personal relationship. And it was written in that with that in mind. Right. But the fact of the matter is, one of the things I always tell executives to do is read the five love languages mm -hmm. because it talks about these that people are that, you know their love language may be gifts or acts of service or physical touch or words of affirmation or whatever or time mm -hmm. you know these kind mm -hmm. of things. And, and when you look at an employee base, no matter how large or how small it is, everybody has a love language, something that drives them. So mm -hmm. if, for example, if yours is, um, is, if yours is words of affirmation, Nailed that it. means what you, yeah, yeah, I, that, well, that's what I am. So it's easy. But, but if, if yours is words of affirmation and I get you a book called the five love languages, I say, you ought to read this. It's great. You'd say, okay, big deal. But if I say to you, dude, you're great. I love working with you. Yeah. You're going to think, oh, you're wonderful. Because <laughs> you like because me. You really like me, Sally Field. Yeah. But, but, it's, but it's, your, it's your love language, right? Yeah. And one of the things I find that really trips up people as they, as they move up leadership ranks in a company is they lose that sight uh, they want everybody to to conform to them because I'm in charge yeah. versus understanding no. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the, and here's a great case in point. When I was president of the American Leadership Foundation, I was very blessed. I had an incredible advisory board. I had uh, five U.S. senators from different sides of the aisle. I had the former head of the DEA. I had the former president of the Citadel. I had um, the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and a number of mm -hmm. other people. But one day I was talking to Admiral Thomas Moore, who was the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And I said, how do you win leadership? And he said, look, I don't relate to it the way you do. So let me tell you the way I do it. And I said, yes, sir. <laughs> and he said, Bo, I serve my troops honorably mm -hmm. because I've learned if I serve my troops honorably, I'm always serving my superiors and my country honorably. And I and so what so so take that idea and bring it into for profit America, right? Into the executive boardroom. If wow. people were more intent on serving their employees mm -hmm. honorably, serving their customers honorably, they'd always serve their their superiors, and they would always right. be serving their their investors. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but it's, it's just something that a lot of people lose sight of yeah. because they want to get somewhere quickly. I know, I know Disney purported to do this. They were first said there's, uh, you know, actors or their performers, you know, they all consider them characters in the, in the mix. But that was, you know, they focused on employees and that will all make take care of the customers. Um, that was what they said. And then I talked to a former employee. And said, What's exactly what he experienced there, but. Um, well, you know what I think happens, Doug. I, I think the the far like when Walt Disney, Walt Disney, yeah. when he was uh, when they opened, uh, I think it was Disney World, and Walt yeah. Disney had passed away. The the guy goes up to the podium to bring Mrs. Disney up, and she said, "It's a shame Walt wasn't here to see this." She walked up and said, "No, you don't understand. Walt saw this. Yeah, this is how this happened." Mm -hmm. But I think the farther you get away from the visionary, 
That's it. See, people, people lose sight of the power of the vision mm -hmm. in the person of the leader. Yeah. And the impact that that can have on an organization. The farther you get away from that vision of the leader, the, the, the more the values begin to shift in an organization. Mm -hmm. I believe that when Walt Disney had these visions for what he wanted to accomplish, mm -hmm. that story was probably true. Yeah. The farther it's gotten away from Walt Disney and the vision, it, it, it falls into the culture of America and is shaped yeah. by the culture of America versus driving the culture. Uh, that's so true. I, I'm, not, I'm thinking of Steve Jobs now, like, you know, when they kicked him out and things went down the, the tubes, they didn't roll back in and then boom, five major wins with Pixar and uh, iPods yeah. and whole deal. So, yeah, vision is. But that's, vision is but that's leadership. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and vision is just a piece of it. Right. So. So, I mean, when I wrote my first book, I interviewed a lot of very successful people, mm -hmm. all degree walks of life. Yeah. And. And that's where I came out with those five core principles, vision, courage, perseverance, responsibility, and character. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I sit today and I, and I think one of the biggest challenges we have in this country, <clears throat> and, and you feel it globally as well, is that last piece, is, is the character. Yeah. Boardrooms, boardrooms, not all boardrooms, it would be unfair to say, but many boardrooms today are, are they're so focused on the bottom line yeah. that how we get there doesn't matter anymore. I mean, I've sat in yeah. enough boardrooms where I've heard people say, they'll never know. They'll never know. And I have to tell you, you will always be found out. Yep. You can't hide that. Yeah. Yeah, that's so true. So run those past again, the five principles. So, so those, take, take a minute on each one if you can. Yeah. Okay. So so when I when I interviewed people, they, they talked a lot. Of, I, I wanted to know what, what, what different leaders from different walks of life, whether they were um, – uh, uh, Hall of Fame athletes or, or United States senators or business people with their attributes of leadership were. Mm -hmm. And they said things like risk and tact and teamwork, yeah. you know, different things. Yeah. But every man and woman I spoke to said the same five words, vision, courage, perseverance, responsibility, and character. Huh. And, and it, just to take a minute on each one of them, it's real simple. So, yeah. so the vision is that ability to look forward and live out of your imagination. Yeah. Versus looking backwards and living out of all your challenges. And, the, and, and on that, one of the things I would suggest to people, and, and I tell executives this all the time, stop living in the past. Yeah. You're, and my wife says it so much more eloquently than I do. She says, yeah. your past is not a residence. It's a reference point. Love it. Love it. Don't live there. Move yeah. forward. So, mm -hmm. so vision gives you that ability to live out of hope. Mm -hmm. and, and, and hope is the heartbeat of action. Mm. So live out of hope. So, so you have vision, which is, you know, I, I, if you remember when you were 12, you, you got pictures, all these things you wanted your life to look like, yeah. and you talked about them a lot. Yeah. I'm going to be a pro football player, whatever it was. I'm going to be a musician and sing on stages. And then what, what happens, you get older, and then you come into what people consider the real world where you stop doing that. And I tell people all the time, you got to you gotta be that 12-year-old if you really want to accomplish something big. Yeah. So vision, second thing is courage. Courage, is, courage is, an, is an odd bird. Courage is never something you find. Courage is something that finds you. Wow. And, it find, and it finds the practiced you, the rehearsed you, the person that... Anytime you do something, um, I was I was explaining to somebody the other day that whenever I talk, people will say, "Well, you do this with such posture," and it's like, "Okay, but I'm I've been doing this for thirty five years. Posture is nothing more than 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 um, confidence. Confidence is born through repetition, and repetition at its core is practice. Right. You fail, you fail, you fail, mm -hmm. you figure it out. Mm -hmm. So." So courage is that thing that rewards people that practice. Mm. And, and, and my point is this, if you're, if you're scared to pick up a phone and call somebody, if you're scared of a sales call, if you're scared and you do it over and over again, there's going to come a day where you're going to feel this thing wrap its arms around you from behind, whisper in your ear, I'm courage and you're going to be okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, I was in my dad's office. He was chief of staff or very prominent United States Senator for 30 years. Yeah. And I was in my dad's office one day and the secretary of the army was in the And my dad uh, said, tell Bo about what you did in Vietnam. And this guy used to chase the Viet Cong through the tunnels. Wow. And, and, 
And he was the first one who led his troops in. He was first. And I said to him, I said, with all due respect, Mr. Secretary, were, were you scared? And he goes, sure, I was scared. Yeah. But then he added, but I was prepared. Mm. And when you're prepared, courage finds you. You have yeah. vision, courage, perseverance. Napoleon said the greatest attribute of a soldier is not loyalty. It's not courage. Mm. It's endurance. Wow. It's endurance. Yeah. It's just the ability to keep going when everyone else stops. Mm -hmm. And some of that is just habit. It's habit. You just create a habit of going. When other people stop, you keep going. Mm -hmm. um, uh, responsibility, vision, courage, perseverance, responsibility. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I think it was Winston Churchill said the price of greatness is responsibility. Mm -hmm. when it, one of the things I find with insecure executives is mm -hmm. they, they always want to place blame and take credit. Yes. <laughs> Great leaders give credit and take blame. Yep. Mm -hmm. It's being responsible. And the, and the last one in just one minute intervals is would be character. Yeah. Uh, William, William Reed says character strikes the last blow in any battle. Mm -hmm. Character is not what you say to your customers. Mm -hmm. Character is not what you say to your friends. Character is not what you say to your peers. Mm -hmm. Character is what you say about your customers, mm -hmm. about your friends, and about your peers when they don't hear you. That's right. And, and the last part of that I would share this with you is um, there are some people that will be a certain way at work and a certain way at home, and it's different. Yeah. And they'll, 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 they'll and I don't mean this literally, but they'll kick the dog and yell at the kids, you know, right, kind of thing. Right, yeah. And at work, they seem real magnanimous. Yep. But the fact of the matter is, character is not compartmentalized. No. You can't have it in one part of your life and not have it in the other. That's right. If, if, if that's the case, you don't have it. Yeah. You're pretending to be somebody you're not. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, those are, that's, that's, that's kind of what, what spawned my first book. Were those. Just, you know, folks, just go below and get these show notes and memorize them because it's just, every, it's just gold, man. It's just gold. Um, I want to wrap up with a question and then we can wrap up the show, Bo. But of those five things, I'm making mental notes here. And I'm thinking some of them, you mentioned repetition for, uh, you know, courage and, and perseverance and whatnot. That can be learned through repetition. But in some cases, I'm wondering if some things are born, we're born with and we can't develop or are all those things learned abilities? Oh, great question. I, I, I think that um, leadership at its core, I mean, there, listen, you can't coach... Uh, charisma no well yeah right you can't coach charisma you right. can't coach being an extrovert mm -hmm. you can't coach those things you can coach processes skill sets mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but leadership is something you can mentor uh -huh. you can because even if you're shy and you've had a horrible challenge in life or you're extroverted and everything's gone your way in life theoretically you can still coach people on let's find for you what the vision is for your life. Mm -hmm. Let's find for you how to, how, how courage can find you. Let's find mm -hmm. for you how to keep going when everyone else stops. I mean, you, because I think, I think there's this thing we all have, this in, inward compass that we all have that kind of yeah. guides our life. Yeah. And, and I, uh, I, so no, I, I think you're you're born with a certain kind of charisma. You're born with an extra version. You know, hey, I'm I like talking to people. Yeah, but you can coach people and mentor people how to be better leaders. Mm -hmm. How how these attributes can impact their life and thereby a lot of other people right. in a very positive way. Right, because there's introverted leaders and extroverted leaders. They both can be. Oh. Sure, Some right. of the best leaders are introverts. Yeah. Because an introverted leader has the ability to say, look, if I can do it, you can do it. That's right. Right? If I can do it. An extrovert, they always get this rap. Well, of course you can do it. You're an extrovert. Right. But an introverted leader has power they don't realize they have. People that mm -hmm. are introverted have power they don't realize they have if they would learn how to find it and capitalize. Love that. Love that. Wow. Well, that concludes our show today, though. I'd like to have you back again sometime because there's so much more we can talk about, but we got, we got to get rolling. Um, go ahead and give us the uh, the shameless plug on the five power principles, though. I want to hear about that. No, I, I got to tell you, this is good. So this will give us the opportunity to take this yeah. and, and, and use it. 
Um, when the pandemic first hit, my team came to me and said, you know, you got to put this online. You got to make this available to people. Right. And so I did probably some of my best work, I think. I developed a, an online leadership and mentoring program mm -hmm. called fivepowerprinciples.com. The number five, powerprinciples.com. Okay. And if you go there, it, it's everything from, from how to develop that vision in your life. Um, the, I've got a whole section there, Doug, on cleaning out your closet, getting rid of the toxin. One of the things, okay. you know, I, I have this thing I say to people, if you don't like where you've ended up, just remember you drove the car. Right. If you don't like the, where you're living right now, you better change some things about you. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that is just toxicity. You know, some people have the wrong friends in their life. Some people drink too much. Some people mm -hmm. are preoccupied with video games too much. I mean, there's all yeah. these toxic things that keep people from accomplishing their best life. Right. Um, but it's called, but I, 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 I'm going to underscore it because it's something that if people will take it back advantage of and mm -hmm. that they can sit down. There's a workbook for each video. There's nice. also, I think, eight other videos I threw in there just to make mm -hmm. sure people had, but it's called fivepowerprinciples.com. Okay. Terrific. Uh, it's right below you here, folks. So if you're looking at this or watching it, go to fivepowerprinciples.com. You can click on the link below as well as get those show notes. So Bo, thank you so much for being on the show today. Really appreciate it. Uh, Doug, thank you. I'm honored to be here and I just appreciate you so much. You bet. Have a good one. And that concludes our show today on the Author Brand Show. You're going to want to take notes. I hope you did. And if you didn't, they're right below you. Thanks so much. We'll see you later.